and then let's move to to the discussion um, part um, of of this session. And um, we received already some questions. So I, I, I gonna um, start going through them. Um, the the first one is um, is to Eloise, and it's about uh, um, the the youth participatory processes. And um, and and um, the question is, what sort of a knowledge? do young people get from participating in, in the process? Uh, for example, public budgets or public procurements. And I would also add uh, um, a, a part of the question myself, which is how to make them really interested in these topics that are, you know, official things uh, see, yep. seem to be serious things. So how, why do they get engaged in these uh, mm -hmm. processes? <clears throat> Okay, so um, thanks for giving me the time to, to answer these questions. Um, so basically, for, for the first question, uh, what do young people get to learn from this process? A couple of things. Uh, first one being, yes, uh, public procurement processes. Those things, um, you know, it's the ages of the young people we targeted was 8 to 24, so it was very broad. Um, but they got to learn about what the pro public procurement processes, but also in general, what a participatory budgeting is at the level of New York, but also at the hyperlocal of each of the areas uh, of New York. Um, so that was the first thing. Uh, the second thing is they learned about what it meant to also offer some solutions for the pandemic uh, crisis. There were the ones that had the idea of organizing some uh, office hours. They were the ones who also, we tested the platform, so the one we had, we tested the design with them, so they could be in that part of the design and that they could tell us this is this, this text is not clear, it's to, uh, you know, it's to a public institution, uh, this text is not clear, this image is not clear as well, and they were the one who gave us feedback from the design, so that was, we, I think that's an important part of their work also, is just including them at the very beginning of the design and they got to learn about what that design process is. Um, they also learned um, how to be ambassadors of the cause. Uh, they learned to spread the word. Something you, you have to know is that, so Cobro, the, the NGO, um, one of our partners, are the ones who organize every year what is called a youth fellowship. And it means that people, um, young people that are interested from diverse neighborhoods in New York to participate in, um, in just in general, like participatory processes of the city can apply to this fellowship and they, they, they can become ambassadors of participatory processes. So the best thing to make other young people engaged is that the message is actually, you know, worn by young people. Um, so that was an important part of them. So they learned about the process, the procurement process, some more city uh, related topics and um, how to be an outreach actors, actor and a very important one. Um, that was important. And I wanted to just add something uh, about, cause it was um, like the evaluation of the projects at the end was still done by uh, the city. But in other cases of PBs, you can actually include uh, young people at that level or citizens in general by creating this sort of evaluation committee um, that is um, either randomly selected, you use random selection to you know, get people to be in that uh, evaluation committee, or you select them because you have a fellowship and you know that you, know, you can include these people in, uh, in the evaluation process. And I think that's important because again, um, PB is a very classic process and you need to renew it with your local actors with the ways and the methods you already uh, are applying. Um, yeah, I think that answers the question uh, both. If not, just let me know. <laughs> I found your, um, your um, <clears throat> story extremely interesting because it was uh, from the USA. Um, mm -hmm. which is, I guess, in many ways, a very different culture than Europe. And I wanted to mm -hmm. ask you whether do you experience differences from your uh, <laughs> projects in, in Europe or to, to what extent yeah. can we look at the US as an interesting or an example that we need to follow or we need to get inspired from? And, and what are the things where, you know, what you definitely would not be able to do in Europe or simply what differences yeah. did you see? Um... 
something that struck me from our collaboration with the with the U.S. because we also work with Chicago and Phoenix, uh, Arizona, and um, something that's very um, you know from from the culture the part the culture of participation in the U.S. is basically um, a very and a, a strong accent on marginalized communities, which is great. Uh, it's part of their culture to be progressist in those cities, uh, to be progressist and to think about, you know, how can we design outreach strategies, even though it takes six months, how do we design outreach strategies so we can include uh, those people and this public that we targeted and that is coming from marginalized communities, even in the midst of pandemic. And I think that's something that was very frustrating for, uh, for Coro and, and actors who were on the ground that they designed all of that before the pandemic and they had to implement their methods during the pandemic. Um, but we still targeted the communities that we wanted thanks to the youth who actually, you know, through them and their um, uh, ambassadorship uh, got to actually, you know, target those people. Um, and I guess the second thing is that they give time and sense and resources to participatory processes. Um, in France, we take a city comes to us or, you know, um, an NGO comes to us and says, like, we want to platform to do this participatory process, this consultation. Uh, we need to launch it in three weeks. Um, and that's usually what we have as a time frame. In the U.S., it was um, we are launching a PB for the youth uh, in three months. Then it got delayed by six months. So we had nine months to design uh, the, um, the PB. And that actually allowed us to do some workshops on design, to do some work with all of the involved um, uh, publics. We have some time to do some, you know, also other user tests. So user tests being, you know, including the youth to the design of the platform, et cetera. So I think they give more time. Um, in terms of, um, I don't, yeah, I don't have any, I guess maybe just um, they they stick to the classics of PB, even though they renew it. I think we should think about how we can think about participatory process in, in another sense, uh, being consultations, petitions, um, direct democracy, uh, organizing movements, et cetera, et cetera. I think in the US it's very, um, uh, at least in New York, Chicago, it's very um, in the context of the PB and PB is a huge thing over there. I would now move to Ciprian. However, we have some more questions for you, Eloise, so be prepared. Um, um, so Ciprian, um, in, during the, the COVID-19, the first uh, lockdown, uh, for example, we've seen the examples of NGOs reacting more efficiently uh, in helping communities than um, official uh, institutions often. Um, did this fact that that community that the the pandemic showed the the importance of community engagement of local actors, did it uh, in any way um, have an impact on the discourse about the value of civil society and their role uh, in in public life? Thank you, Petra, for the for the question. It is a, a good question because indeed in the first part uh, the social society did do a better job. Uh, we still do it. Maybe now the uh, local, the authorities, the local and the central authorities, are starting to move a little bit better, not necessarily very fast. Um, however, there was a, a little bit of um, uh, in the in the discourse in Romania that was a little bit of a fight because uh, the public could see that NGOs were extremely um, active. For instance, let's see, let's say the in the city of Sibiu, for instance, the first problem was testing. So there were only a few cities in Romania that you would have testing. And uh, the first equipment that was bought in Sibiu and in Timisoara and in other cities, it was bought by the civil society and the local communities and not uh, necessarily authorities, which did not have funds for that. And we were able to move very quickly because uh, you know, the, all the procurement and everything is uh, pretty complicated for the um, uh, authorities. And um, some, of the, some of the people, of the politicians in the authorities did not recognize this kind of the support that uh, the civil society provided, which was very obvious to the public. And, uh, you know, in Romania, we have this kind of um, bad habit when people, uh, politicians say, you know, uh, an NGO did this, an NGO did that, but um, 
they, they don't say the name of the organization. It's just like an anonymous uh, NGO does this or that, which is uh, sometimes is really hurtful when you hear something like that. Uh, but uh, so this there was this kind of debate in the public space in Romania where some politicians did not uh, admit that this was happening, but then they had to roll back on their discourse because people were really mad because they could see with their own eyes that, uh, uh, as you see, uh, maybe you saw in our um, presentations, we were pretty aggressive in communicating what we were doing. So we would have this report and infographic on each and every day. And we put all the uh, all our expenses and everything that we bought every every single day for a period in uh, in March and April. So it was very obvious what we were doing. That we, it was obvious that the hospitals did not have protective equipment. It was obvious they did not have enough tests. It was obvious they they lacked different type of equipment. So yes, it did change uh, some things because, uh, for instance, from my organization point of view, even though we are an eight years old organization it was this period that we got uh, even better known in the community for that support that we for the support that we provided so i think this was uh, also a national level at some point um, and it was a good thing but uh, i think now uh, we had elections and during this year and i think we are, now we are seeing a, a little bit of uh, again uh, I think a nasty phenomenon when we have uh, new parties at power and uh, we have very uh, young politicians that are trying to uh, stay ahead and uh, they're trying to, uh, I don't know, uh, many people from NGOs, they're going into administration and politics. So there's, a, I think, a huge uh, change right now going on in, uh, in Romania. And we're probably going to have to, to look over to a new generation of uh, civil society. So there is some sort of a threshold going on right now. Thank you. And you you mentioned uh, or you discussed the, the the great amount of money you raised. Did the local government make uh, a kind of co-funding uh, to to the funds that you raised? So was there any matching of funds, or was it simply raised by you and spent on this public duty? This would be one question. And the other question. Um, is regarding uh, the transparency you mentioned that you for you that was a very high priority issue, but did this um, this um, exposure of transparency also impact uh, how people look at the local government that they should be as well transparent about their spending? So did does did it have an effect to increase the the need for accountability on 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 the level of public administration as well? We did get in touch with the local government, of course, because they uh, they rule over the local hospital. Um, they didn't provide matching. Uh, do, they were not related to our campaign directly, but um, they provided their own funds to the hospital because they needed to, but not related to our uh, our uh, campaign. So, uh, in this happened in Sibiu, for instance, you had another. Um, you had another situation in Timisoara, another city where the, for instance, the town hall was much more involved in the campaign and they they were partners in this campaign. So it was actually the town hall that also um, uh, called for people to make donations for the community foundations, for instance. So it depends a little bit also on the way, I don't know, uh, of the local authorities. But what is important to say, I think, is that yes, uh, of an interesting phenomenon happened during this campaign uh, because our local regional council also started their own fundraising campaign uh, inspired by our own campaign and in this campaign there was they were exactly as transparent as we were so they took our example and they tried to raise their own money in a way and they did manage to raise some funds because I don't know. They have some good relations with a large, some large companies in the in the town, but I think it was for the first time that we had this kind of transparent uh, uh, fundraising, and I think the local government uh, really got a lot of inspiration from from us. But uh, yeah, maybe with the spending, not as much. Uh, so more on the fundraising part. Uh, maybe this is not such a good idea, but. 
you know, the, the budgets of the hospitals, they are pretty complicated stuff and uh, a little bit difficult to understand what a hospital needs at, in a certain period because the kind of expenses are going in all the ways, let's say. Um, so yeah, maybe maybe there there is there isn't so much uh, transparency in how the the money is actually spent by the uh, the regional council uh, council for the hospitals. Um, but I think uh, you know we we did manage to sort of create a new standard for transparency regarding the hospital and people understood what kind of uh, needs the hospital has and what kind of amounts you need for certain equipment and stuff like that. Thank you. Thank you. And um, I would move on to Petra, um, but there's going to be also a few more questions, uh, I think, for, for you all and for you, um, Ciprian, and from Petra, but I would be really interested to learn more about is uh, your methodology or the momentum that that you had uh, in order to make the local government open for transparency. So probably there was a, a push needed that from the experience before when the main interest, let's say, of the local government was to benefit from economy, from tourism, what made them uh, understand that there is a need and there is an importance uh, to engage with, with local groups such as yours? Um, what was the, the momentum or what was the fact or, or the processes that, that led to this understanding or what was the advocacy you did to, to enforce it? Uh, well, there is, there is, I wouldn't call it a momentum. This is uh, only the hard work and persistence of many, many people uh, during the last, I think, uh, f uh, 10 to 15 uh, years of just uh, advo advocating this kind of uh, partnerships and this kind of uh, need to acknowledge the importance of the NGOs and the importance of public goods and uh, this participatory governance of uh, public goods. Um, there, uh, when it comes to, for example, Lazarity and the workshop uh, Lazarity, uh, basically he, uh, already in 2000, in the year 2000, they've uh, received a contract from the city of Dubrovnik to govern part of the Lazarity complex. And this was the very first uh, example of uh, such public uh, civil partnership uh, when it comes to governing uh, a space, especially a space which is a, a heritage complex and protected by UNESCO, um, because they've uh, showed that they have uh, the proper uh, networking for getting the funds to um, to fix up the place because it was really devastated after the homeland uh, war uh, because they had the knowledge and uh, just respect in the community and trust in the community to take this very valuable space um, and at the same time they were networking with uh, similar organizations for example we have uh, similar social cultural centers in uh, Zagreb uh, in uh, Rijeka Pula Zadar Split and all of these other cities uh, in Dubrovnik so it's really collaborative uh, effort Effort, uh, just uh, with uh, at the same time just having the f help from uh, various uh, uh, European, uh, for example, experts such as Levent, but there are very many, many more which uh, actually followed us through these processes. Um, and just, you know, just some kind of a persistence and some kind of uh, trust building because as like I said, the participatory governance, when you say that to um, someone, um, in the context of uh, uh, transition country, you know, uh, where democracy is a new concept and it needs to be uh, further stabilized and uh, and just explored and there there was a constant lack of uh, trust and uh, this participatory governance is very scary to the um, public uh, actors sometimes. But I think the key is not just just persisting, just uh, continuing, just exploring, developing, uh, and and just uh, uh, including the local community. Because like in uh, Romania or in other countries, we have this very strong discourse of NGOs just being the ones who only spend the money from the local. Um, 
budget or national budgets and not at the same time giving anything back, which is very, a very wrong idea, especially in the COVID. That's why I've asked Cyprian, uh, because during the COVID-19 lockdown, the NGOs in Dubrovnik were the ones who really helped the community uh, uh, more efficiently, more actively and uh, in appropriate time. Other than the institutions, we also had a lack of masks, for example. We also had a lack of uh, just institutions being able to get to the elderly people to get them uh, food or to get them supplies that they needed because they weren't able to get out of their houses, etc. So all these small efforts of opening up the spaces of just collaborating, dial dialoguing, etc., really make the difference in long time, uh, uh, in the long term, because this is, uh, you know, we usually say this is not a one-time race. This is a marathon. So uh, basically, we need to move on further to just uh, 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 advocate the uh, to the policymakers that they need to include these kinds of uh, centers uh, in their in their uh, legal framework in their uh, policy framework in order to uh, ensure the stability of these centers. Thanks. And one question or one topic I think that was also raised by Ciprian uh, when he was uh, discussing the marathon. And I guess when we talk about cultural centers and Eloise uh, as, was asking this uh, as well here in the, in, the, in the comments that I think in arts, personal meetings are such a fundamental element of, of, uh, of programs. Um, and, and could you share a bit how this, uh, how, how the pandemic and the push towards online uh, impacted it, uh, your activities uh, and the spaces you were um, operating in? First of all, we've um, successfully translated this into an online environment when it comes to group work or when it comes to major uh, activities or majorly attended activities uh, because we've set uh, good foundations to the communication uh, very uh, it wasn't an issue just to uh, translate this communication uh, in an online format even though it uh, appears to be m more uh, distant than a uh, personal contact uh, in the same room uh, and because we had uh, some goals that we wanted to achieve and that's probably some concrete goals some concrete deadlines that we needed to work on to fulfill them uh, with the participation of everyone uh, involved um, basically we've been uh, in and out of uh, lockdowns some big spaces in which we can accommodate all the people um, uh, more safely and with uh, the standards uh, of epidemiological measures and everything uh, so uh, we are just um, we are just sailing through the, the conditions and just accommodating uh, whenever we can and at the same time we've uh, so basically at, at the beginning of the project we all worked collaboratively uh, me, having uh, larger meetings, then uh, we've realized that at one point these two centers are going to have to have some kind of uh, um, time for themselves just to explore uh, their possibilities, their their uh, needs, etc. So uh, they were working on their own at one time. Uh, so th that's probably something that also helped us as as uh, as a situation because um, it was a smaller group working uh, together. Together. But I think that uh, because of these good foundations, we we it didn't really um, it didn't really affect the stability of the communication or the decision making uh, process in the end. Thank you. And um, as we are at the end of our time, I really want to do a, a, only a very quick round and a question, the same question to all of you which is a bit about the takeaways from, from the pandemic period and, and, and how you address this as a challenge. What do you think is, is, is a good learning or something that you hope will prevail uh, from the experiences or practices that you needed or managed to introduce now? Um, and, and it would be good that if, we, if life returns to normal or better than uh, before, um, this should be part of it based on what you experience? My main lesson is uh, don't, um, don't forget to invest time and resources to participation. Uh, just because you have a pandemic doesn't mean that you can just put participation on the bench. Um, and I think that 
my second lesson um, would be to um, design the adapted outreach methods to avoid forgetting people that don't know how to use or are not comfortable with technology. Um, especially when you when you do an online participation uh, process, you exclude by nature 20% of the population, which is huge. Um, so don't forget to think about the young people or the elderly or the less comfortable, the ones who have chosen not to use technology <laughs> uh, to actually you know, accommodate and uh, allow them to have the equal access to participation. And my last point, um, don't forget, and that comes from your research and I think it was really interesting, that the more you make people participate, the more you have this level between participation and representation that levels up um, and you need to, this, what you call this interpenetration between participation and, and representation has to be kept up even during the pandemic and for local NGOs and local society and civil society to make those representative claims. I'm using your words, but I thought they were really interesting. I think my, my takeaway from uh... This year is um, that uh, the pandemic, in a way, um, pushed us into a corner to uh, be better at, at adapting. So even though it was maybe not a natural process that happened, but uh, it just showed us that maybe this is the kind of uh, mindset that we should be having any time, not just uh, during the pandemic. So if we uh, grow our organizations to be adaptive as a f uh, mindset. I think it 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 was it would be better for us um, during all sorts of activities that we are having uh, to have a, an adaptive strategy. So this made us think a lot about what we do and what is our purpose in the community. And now we are trying to be uh, to adapt our strategy more uh, closely to. Um, to be able to listen to what the people in the community are doing and try to sort of feel the zeitgeist of the community and um, of the larger context, uh, try to understand what direction the civil society will be going in the next years and be a little bit uh, more adaptive in our own mission, not necessarily just uh, related to the uh, pandemic. So. Uh, I think this is my, my main takeaway. I think this is going to help us to be an uh, even more sustainable organization and uh, provide our uh, stakeholders with, I don't know, better services from now on. Uh, similarly to the colleagues, I think that this pandemic actually showed us how important uh, participation is because um, this collaboration that we've been uh, dealing with, with the networking and, the part and insisting on participation and shared responsibilities actually led us to some uh, uh, higher level of uh, solidarity in the end, which helped us to avoid the major consequences of the lockdown or the Base, basically prepared us for the next um, economical failure, etc., that is uh, going to happen after this uh, first wave uh, of uh, pandemic, and actually um, made us rethink the, how resilient we are as a society and as a local community um, in in uh, in uh, uh, the future uh, future months and years to come uh, to just go through all these consequences. So, um, yeah, solidarity is probably the key and this is something that we need to aim for uh, in the future and this and can be achieved only through active participation of everyone of all, whether they are civil, public or private uh, actors. Thank you, Petra. I think that was a great uh, closing message uh, for for this session. And thank you all for participating and sharing your experiences. Um, I hope we are going to have the chance to be in touch in the future as well and uh, learn from you more and maybe even cooperate. And um, with this, I would close this part of the program. And uh, through after uh, maybe one, two minutes technical break, the next session will start. So thank you and see you soon.